Hello, everybody. Welcome to, to this talk after this wonderful keynote we just had. And just before lunch, and the room is still packed, so uh, I guess you are hungry people. So I'll try to go as fast as possible so that we can uh, go and uh, grab a sandwich and a cup of coffee before continuing this, uh, this conference. So this talk is about uh, synchronous APIs in Java 8, and namely, completable future. A future that is complete and that is completable, that is not obviously the future of the universe, more the future inside the JVM, which lies inside a, a PC, living expectancy is maybe two or three years, so much, much more modest than uh, the universe we just saw. Uh, I'd like to begin by talking about this asynchronous keyword, because it's, it's some kind of buzzword, usually I don't really like buzzwords, uh, but since this is the main subject of the talk, I, I think we could spend just a, a few minutes to, uh, to define this word. Uh, let, let's take a very simple example. Suppose we have three tasks to execute in our JVM, and I need, I want, what I want, of course, is to execute them as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible. Now, there might be some I.O. in them, some blocking stuff, I really don't know. The first easiest way, of course, to execute them is just to go for a synchronous execution, take one thread, execute the tasks one by one. It is the, also the least efficient, of course, way to do it. And the second way to do it, I might think about, is, all right, I'm going multi-thread, one thread, one task, quite easy. And if I'm lucky enough to have uh, at least three calls uh, CPU, it will all execute in parallel, just as it is written here. Now, if I have only one call, since it is multi-threaded and that the thread scheduler is smart enough to detect that a task is blocking uh, and pass the hand to another task, it might execute like that. First T1, then some piece of T2, then T3, then T1 again, etc. This is multi-threaded execution on only one call. It's very classical. I guess we all know uh, what it is. Now, I could go asynchronous. And asynchronous, in fact, is kind of the same as multi-threaded on one core. It, just not, it doesn't work the same inside the, the API, but it looks like it works the same. And even if I go on a multi-core, the execution will be the same as the previous one, most probably. Why? Because asynchronous does not mean multi-threaded. Basically, asynchronous stays in the same thread. Now, I could compare synchronous versus asynchronous. Is asynchronous any faster? Well, it depends on my asynchronous engine, in fact. If this engine is able to switch from one task to another, it will be indeed faster. If it's not the case, it will be the same kind of performance. But I could compare synchronous, uh, multi-threaded versus asynchronous. Is asynchronous any faster than multi-threaded? Well, it can be. Because asynchronous in, is non-blocking, and because if I'm in a multi-threaded model, I need to switch the context of the threads. And this, I will not have to pay for that in an, in, in an asynchronous world. And there is a second aspect of it. Since asynchronous takes place in the same thread, all the operations do not need to be visible from each other because precisely I am in the same thread. So no visibility problem, no atomicity problem, no synchronization problem. What could be the pattern of some asynchronous call? Let us write this kind of thing. This is pure metacode. This is not Java, even if it looks like Java. I've got some kind of query engine that will talk to some kind of database or whatever. I pass a request, could be SQL, could be something else, and for each element of the, of the result, I want to just to print, print them out. Uh, everything in an asynchronous world is a program with callbacks. And the fact is, in Java 8, we have lambdas, and lambdas are just great, are just the right tool to, uh, to build callbacks. This, for each method, takes what we call in the, in the functional interface word a consumer. Consumer takes a value, doesn't return anything, and it's really great to do uh, some callback for that. Okay, so this is, those lambdas are, are really great to make a callback. When the result is available, the task will be called on all the elements of the result, and this is what makes the, the, the thing asynchronous. The result is pushed to the callback instead of having the result uh, pulled from the, the, the list or from the intermediate structure and passed to the, to the lambda expression. 
All right, this is all very fine, but as I said, it's not Java code, it's just meta code. How can we write this kind of thing in Java? The problem is that up to Java 7, we do not have much tools to program this kind of thing. We have this runnable object, if since Java 1, the very early days of Java. Now, runnable object doesn't take any parameter, does not return anything, doesn't store any exception. So it's not very nice to build uh, uh, systems with, uh, with runnable because it's just mute and blind. Since Java 5, we have the callable. Basically, the callable is some kind of runnable. But the nice thing is that it can return a value and it can also throw uh, exceptions. And in Java 5, we have a new tools also that we are going... Ah, this is picture time. Excuse me. Hello. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, we need to make this ladies' work easier. <laughs> All right, where was I? Ah, yes, future. Uh, no, not future, the universe. Yes, future in Java. Yes, so basically what I can do in Java 5 is I take a task, whether runnable or callable, call call I send this task to a pool of threads, and I, what I get back is a, the future object. And what can I do with the future object? Well, I can, I've got basically one, one pattern to get the result, which is the get pattern. And the, the thing that is not so nice is that the get method uh, is blocking. That is, if the result is not ready, get will not... Uh, return, of course, it will wait for the result to be ready uh, to return. So this get result might, might take a while, and during that time, what I would like to do, of course, is something else, uh, advance my other computations, for instance. The problem with this pattern is that this object, the result object, is computing, it's computed in the runnable or in the callable, and taken back to the thread that generated this task, through the get method of the future. So this future object is, in fact, some kind of a bridge between two threads, the threads in which the computation took place, and the uh, calling thread. And passing an object from one task to another has to be handled in the master thread until Java 7. I have to get this object back and to send it back to another task if I want to chain different tasks. And this is precisely what Completable Future is going to address. I will not have to do that anymore in a Completable Future. So we have a new tool in Java 8 to handle this precise case and to bring a solution to chain tasks. That handles both asynchronous and multi-threaded programming, which is nice because nobody understands asynchronous programming, nobody understands concurrent programming, so when you mix them together, you really get something absolutely impossible to understand. This is great. My name is Jose, right? This is my picture. By the way, this picture has been taken by this nice lady that just uh, came here two years ago. Uh, I've got some uh, resources on the web if you want to check that out. On, uh, I wrote an article for Java Magazine. I also have online courses for a company called Pluralsight. I also have some on the Microsoft Virtual Academy. Microsoft Virtual Academy is publishing Java courses. Can you imagine that? All right, and also on Parlays, hopefully for one more year. Okay, if you have questions, what, why don't we, we, we use Twitter? Uh, there is an application in the, in the app we've downloaded uh, for DevOps uh, this year. The problem, it seems that the questions are lost when the talk is finished. Uh, so if you want your question to be, to be there in the next few days so that we can continue to interact, I think that Twitter is uh, still uh, probably a better solution. All right. Let us create an asynchronous task and let us see an example. Maybe an example that some of you already came across. It's an example taken from Jersey. You know, the Jersey is the uh, implementation of uh, JAXRS. And this is a copy paste from, uh, from the documentation of Jersey. What is going on here? I've got an asynchronous uh, REST uh, service, in fact which is programmed like that. I've got some long operation uh, to be conducted. And of course, since I don't want my REST service to be blocking, uh, what, I, what, what I want to do, basically, is run this long operation in another thread. So this is the proposed pattern from the Jersey documentation. Create a runnable, pass this runnable to a new thread, and call the start method on this new thread. It might be not that great to write things like that. We are in Java 8, so we could write them like that but take an executor service, call the executor method with a callable. Now callable is a functional interface, so we can implement this interface with a lambda expression, just as it is the case uh, here. 
which is nice. Now the question is, I am a fanatic of TDD, clean code, and things like that. I guess we all are. And I would like to unit test this code. And the problem is that what I want to unit test is that the result of the long operation has been properly computed and passed to the resume method. The problem is that since it is wrapped in a runnable and executed in another thread, I need to check that once this thread has finished its work, but I have no clue when this thread has finished its work. I am in a really uh, bad situation because I cannot do this easily. It's too bad because just to test this kind of thing, I have mocks for that. I could write very easily some kind of Mokito uh, test, and if it, everything was run in the same thread, it wouldn't pose any problem to do that. Let us give one more look at the code. In orange, this is the code that is executed in the current thread, the thread of my test. And in blue, executed in another thread because it is the code of the callable. I'm passing here, maybe it's a runnable. Okay, so it's executed in another thread. And what I want to do is to put some kind of callback once this runnable has finished its execution, I want to get the result and check if my mocks have been properly called with the proper objects. If I have mock to chain, we, I have mock to check if the resume is properly called with the, with the proper result object. It's a very basic test. We, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody already wrote this kind of tech. But what is tricky is that I am in an asynchronous world, so I need to check that in the same thread or in, an, in, the, th in the blue thread that was on the previous uh, slide. What I could do is mock a sync response, for instance. I could even mock the result, and if I do this kind of thing, my mock is this one. Sorry, if I do this kind of thing, what I, what I want to execute after that is just verify that result has been passed to the resume method on the mock async response uh, mock object. But I need to verify that once the run method has been called and has finished its execution. And if I look, take a look carefully at that, since I am in a multi-threaded world, I also need to take this into account, the multi-threaded aspect of things. All right? What I'm basically doing is reading and writing on a mock object. If my mock object is created and trained, that is written, in the thread of my test, and if I uh, check my mock in the thread of my runnable, those are not the same thread, and most probably the modification made on my mock will not be visible from one thread to another. So, in an ideal world, I want this modification to be made visible, and the simplest way of doing that is to train and verify my mock in the same thread as the runnable, which is tricky. So, my constraints are the following. I need to verify my mock once the run method has been executed, and I need to read and write my mock in the same thread as the run has been executed. And this is precisely where the completable future or the completion stage, completion stage of the interface, comes to the rescue. Let us just take this code out of this async get and just take a look at this pattern. I take an executor, call the submit method with some runnable or a callable. Here it's a callable. Right. This pattern in the completable future world will become this one. I call completable future run async. This is a static method from this class. I take my uh, call, uh, runnable here and pass it as a parameter to this run async method. And instead of calling this on the executor, I pass the executor as a parameter. So basically, it does the same thing, but with, the, but with a different pattern. And the nice thing is that this code returns an object which is not a future as the submit call from Java 5, but a completable future object with a bunch of new methods that we're going to see and that will solve the problem. On this completable future object, what I can call is then run. Then run takes a runnable and the completable future API ensures me that this runnable will be run after the, run, uh, the runnable passed to the run async method of the previous one. So it just do exactly what I need. I still need to take care about visibility issues, and we are going to see that uh, later in the talk. What, what, uh, 
what I would like to say, I, I, I could fix visibility issues with probably atomic variables, synchronizations, volatility, etc. But the simplest way of doing things is just run in the same thread. We just run all the operation in the same thread. So what do I have in this completion stage, uh, completable future API? In fact, I have two elements in this API. The first element is the completion stage. And I have an implementing class, which is completable future. Now, there's something quite, um, I think, unique in the JDK, is that inside the interface itself, I have a method that returns the implementation. So I have a two completable future in the interface that returns the completable future, which is the implementation of the completion stage. What is a completion stage? A completion stage, in fact, is a model for a task in an asynchronous world. What is a task? It is something that performs an action that may return a value or may not return a value, that may take a parameter or may not take any parameter, and that may trigger another task. And that all is also linked to an upcoming task. So it's really a, an element of a chain of completable future. What is uh, the completable future? I said this was the model for the completion state, that is the interface. What is the completable future? From a technical point of view, it's a class, concrete class, so I can just create them quite easily, that implements both future, this old interface from Java 5, and completion stage, new interface from Java 8. A completable future has a state, which is very simple. The task may be running or may not be running still. This task may have complete normally, producing a value or no value. And all these tasks may have complete exceptionally, producing an exception or no exception. There is special code in the completable future to handle exceptions, and we are going to, we are going to see it at the end of this talk. Remember that from future, I had five methods. The first one is the cancel method, just to cancel a future that is not running. I also have a is cancelled and is done to test if my future has been cancelled or has finished during its computation. And I have two other methods, get and a version of get that takes a timeout. All right. Get is a blocking call. We already saw, the, saw it in a previous example. Get with a timeout is not blocking until the timeout runs out. Those methods may throw uh, checked exceptions if the, the task does not run uh, properly. Now, in completable future, I have a first family of method, of methods sorry, that just are, are future-like method. I, I call them like that because they're just some kind of precision added to the existing methods from, uh, from future. I've got a join method, which is basically the same as the get method, but that does not throw any checked exception, so you don't need to mess out with the try catch and stuff. I have a get now method which cancels the, the completable future and provides the value that this completable future should return. Remember, we are in a multi-threaded world, so I could do that in a thread and, my, uh, and it, would, it could free up resources in another thread. I have a complete and obtrude value method that will tell, all right, if this completable future is not complete, then you complete it with the given value. An obtrude value, even if this completable future as complete, then you take this value and reset the value that should be returned by this completable future. And the same for exception, complete exceptionally, and obtrude exception, which is exactly the same semantic as the previous one, but with uh, exception. All right, so those are the easy method methods from completable future. What I didn't say <laughs> at the beginning, maybe I should have said that before, is that there are like 60 or 70 methods in completable future that makes it a little difficult to, to, to handle at first. We are not going to see them all, but uh, most of them, and in a um, summarized way, let's say that, it like that. How to create a, compl a completable future? I have several uh, patterns for that. The, the simplest pattern is uh, to use this completed future a static method. I pass the value that this future should return, and it just returns me a complete future that doesn't do anything uh, apart from returning this value. This, this completable future is completed by nature, so if I call uh, the is done on it, it will always return true. 
And I also saw, already saw the run async method, takes a runnable and an executor service to uh, run this runnable in, the, in the, the past executor service, and the supply async method that takes a supplier. Now, a supplier is a, is a functional interface from Java 8 that doesn't take any parameter and that returns uh, a value. The runnable doesn't return anything. Okay, how can I build now completion stage chains? In fact, I have a set of methods on the completion stage itself that will do some kind of operation and return another completion stage. And this is what we're going to do now. What has to be seen is that a completion stage is a step in a chain. I already said that. It can be triggered by a previous completion stage on which I have called a special method that returned this completion stage. And this, the execution of this completion stage can trigger a further completion stage uh, downside the, the chain. And it can be executed in a given executor. That is, I can take an executor, which is basically a pool of thread, pass it to a completion stage or completable future, and decide to execute this task in the given executor. All right. What is a task? A task has been three things. A runnable, classical object, doesn't take anything, doesn't return anything. A consumer, a consumer takes an object but does not return anything. System out println is the most obvious consumer that we can uh, that we can build. It can also be a function. A function takes an object and returns another object, possibly of another type. So this chain of, of completion stage can be built on tasks that can all be function that is that can transform objects from one step to the other up, up to the up to the exploitation of the result. So that is three types of methods on the completion stage, one method for each type of task, three. What kind of operation does it support? It supports four types of operation. Chaining, chaining is just, I have a completion, uh, completion stage, then another one, then another one. It's some kind of one-to-one -one relationship. Composing, composing is the same type as chaining, but it doesn't work with the same kind of function, right? Combining, what does combining mean? It's that I have two completion, completion stage, and that will be connected to one, and this one completion stage can wait for both results to be available, and will merge them in some way, and then call the, the downside completion stage. And another type of combination, which is triggered on the first value that is available. I may have two completion stage. If the first one generates uh, a result, this result will be passed to the downside completion stage and it will continue without waiting for the other result. This is useful when you want to, for instance, query uh, DNSs. DNSs are all supposed to get you the, the same value, but what you can do to, uh, to accelerate your computation is to launch the same query on, let's say, 10 DNSs and just get the first result, which is the one you want um, fastest, the fastest. So, I have three tasks. I have now four types of chaining, composition, and stuff. That makes 12 methods. Right? We're not done. <laughs> okay. In what thread, sorry, this is not the right side. In what thread can it be executed? If I do not pass any executor to, this, to the method we are building, then it will be executed in the same thread as the upside completion stage. And I can pass a new executor service as a parameter to execute this completion stage in this executor service. All right? And it can also be called asynchronously without passing uh, uh, an executor as a parameter, in which case it will be executed in the common fault join pool. So 3 times 4 times 3, that makes 36 methods just to chain completion stage together. We are not going to see them one by one. <laughs> no problem with that. Let us just see a few patterns to see how the names of those methods have been created. Then apply, called on a completion stage, returns a new completion stage, and will take a function as a parameter that will be able to take the value from the previous completion stage and transform it for the downside completion stage. Then run async, apply is, func fun is for functions, Run is for runnable. Async means that the, this completion stage will be run asynchronously, that is, 
either in the past executor, if I pass an executor as a parameter, either in a common fork join pool, if I do not pass an executor as a parameter. So then run a sync, this is, all right, the, this, this stuff, and then compose a, a sync, this is composition. Composition takes a special kind of function that takes a T and returns a completion stage of U, that is a, a result wrapped in another uh, completion stage. That was for the 1-1 one, one pattern. Let us see some 2-1 patterns. Then combine async. Combine uh, is called on a completion stage and takes another completion stage as a parameter. They are both combined in a B function that will generate a value from the two uh, the upside completion stage to the downside one. Then accept, which is basically the same, uh, same thing, but instead of a B function, will take a B consumer. A B consumer does not generate any value. And if I call the both method on it, then it will take both operation, uh, uh, sorry, both, um, excuse me, both elements generated from the upside. And run after both, I think, will wait for the two upside completion stage. Since it is a run, it takes a runnable that doesn't take any parameter and doesn't generate any value. Let us see some more uh, two one patterns. Uh, apply to either. When I have both, it means that I'm waiting for both results to be available. When I have either at the end of the method, it means that I'm just waiting for the first result to be available and to take it into account. And you can see that on this uh, method, uh, I, I take a function and not a B function because the function is just waiting for the first result uh, to be available. And I also have accept either, accept takes a consumer here as a parameter, different from, uh, from the function. And the run after a sync takes a runnable instead of, uh, of a consumer. So apply is for function, accept is for consumer, same name by the way as the method in the, in the consumer uh, functional interface, and um, run, run for runnable. Okay, so those are just a, a big picture of all the, the patterns I have to combine and to chain completion stages uh, together. Let us go back to our first example. I am going to write now, now that I'm fluent in completable future, I can solve my problem in fact because I have all the tools I need. So let us create a mock of the result and the response, very basic Mockito um, patterns. And I'm going to create a first runnable that will train my mock. This mock should return response when long operation is called on it. Sorry, should return result when response is called uh, long operation method. And another runnable to do the verification, verify that result, result has been passed to the resume method of my mocked uh, response. So the complete pattern will, um, will become this one. First, I create a runnable to encapsulate both the call and then uh, the verification, execute async response, then run uh, verify. And I can just create an executor. Since I want everything to be executed in the same executor service, what I can do is just create an executor with one thread in it and pass this special executor as the executor service of my async resource object. And then uh, use the, run, uh, the completable future API to run uh, async the train of my mock in this monothread executor, then run the call and verify that will call the, the method I want to, uh, to test and call the runnable of the verification of the mock. And if I want to be absolutely sure that my test will run properly, because all this, of course, runs asynchronously in another thread, just, for instance, call the get with the timeout method here to be sure that after 10 seconds, if the, this test has not run, it will generate an exception. So this, is, this leads to a very simple and very clean pattern. The only thing I had to do is to split the method from the jersey uh, stuff in two to get the completable future uh, as a result from a public method. Uh, jersey um, and JAXRS uh, takes the result of the method and has a tendency to, to convert them into JSON and or XML or things like that. If you do that with a completable future, it might not work very well, of course. Let us take a second example, uh, and it's uh, of course inspired from uh, the Java concurrency in practice 
uh, excellent book written by uh, Dougley and Brian Getz uh, years ago. Uh, it's, it, it's about reading pages, getting links, images, etc. from those web pages. So I can supply, I think, uh, this, uh, this task that is just the reading of the page and the generation of, uh, of a, a text element with the content of the page. Then uh, I apply the following function, takes the text, the HTML text of the page, parse the links from that page, and get the result as a list uh, of links, for instance, and then accept this method uh, that takes just a consumer, takes the list of links, and decide to display all those links in a given panel. Now, since I want to display those links in a panel, I, I could be in a Swing application, in a JavaFX application, why not in some kind of Android application? I'm not sure if Android is supporting Lambda expression, probably not. But at least in Swing and JavaFX, I want, of course, this display panel to be updated in the proper thread, that is, the Swing thread. So I need to pass the proper executor service to be sure that this updating will be executed in the proper pull-up thread. Now, the nice thing is that if I check this executor interface, it has only one abstract method in it. So in Java 8, I can implement this interface with a lambda expression. An executor, in fact, is just this. Runnable gives swing utilities invoke later runnable. This is for the, for the thread swing. So I can just pass this executor as a second parameter to my accept async method uh, from here, making sure that this panel will be updated in the right thread. And since I'm a method reference lover, I can also write it like that, leading to an even simpler and cleaner uh, pattern. This is great. I love this kind of thing. Second example, uh, last example, uh, async events in, uh, in CDI. How does uh, uh, events in CDI work? Uh, basically, I, I get an event uh, object from the uh, injection framework of CDI, and I can fire, use the fire method from this event object, passing a parameter that has the type of the parameter of this uh, event object. And on the other hand, I may have a bunch of observe methods annotated like that to get the payload, which in this example is uh, some event, and hold, handle this event uh, synchronously. Uh, the, the events in CDI 1.2 up to 1.2 are synchronous. That is, this observes method will be executed in the same thread as the event fire method. Now, in the upcoming version CVI, CDI 2.0, what, what I could do if I want to go asynchronous is just create my completable future inside the observed method. Now, this is not that great to do that because CDI is about uh, hiding technicalities and comple complex implementation details from the user. So what we are doing in CDI uh, 2.0 is provide a fire async method that will fire this event asynchronously and an observer that is also an asynchronous observer with an observes async annotation on the payload. And this time, this event will be handled in another thread. And once again, if you want to uh, execute your observers in a special thread, you can pass the executor as a parameter to the fire async call, thus exec sorry, executing this sum event in a, in a special thread, in the swing thread if you want to do that. Now the nice thing is, this fire async method returns an object, which is a completion stage. What did we do that? It's because of the handling of exceptions. If you have an exception in the current thread, in this uh, event observer, observer uh, pattern, it will probably uh, do some bad things to the main thread since the thread of the observers is the same as the, uh, as the fire thread. Here it's not the same, so if, we, if an exception is raised in an observer, we need to get this, section, this exception back to the firing thread. And we are just leveraging the completion stage to do that. We have several methods to, to handle exception in the completion stage. One of them is the when complete method to do that. Before going to the exception, one last pattern from, uh, for completion stage. I also have two methods to create completable futures, all of and any of that takes a bunch of completable futures. All of will return a completable future that completes when all the past completable future have complete and any of when the first of them uh, has complete. 
Let us talk a little about exception handling because it's really a, a key point, I think, uh, of this kind of thing. So basically, a completable future can depend on one completable future, two completable futures with the first method we saw, and n completable futures with the two last static methods we just saw. What happens if an exception is thrown is the, in this chain of completion stage? Well, let us have a look at such a chain. Every blue square is, of course, a completable future. They are numbered, so it's nice. And suppose that CF21 raises an exception. What happens is that all the downside completable future will also be in error. What does it mean to be in error? It means that if I call the isCompleted exceptionally method to check if there is an error in it, it will return true. And if I call the get method, it will return an execution exception with the cause of the exception as the root of this exception. So this is what happens if I do that. But the nice thing is, completable future can itself handle exception properly. Suppose we have this completable future pipeline, an exception raised, so all the downside completable future are in error. What I can do is create an intermediate completable future using, for instance, the exceptionally method. And the semantic of this exceptionally method is that if there is no exception in the, in the upside completable future, the result will be transmitted transparently to the next completable future. So everything is like CF30 is not here. And if there is an exception, then uh, CF30 can handle it properly, can get this exception, and can generate a result without any exception to the downside completion stage. How can it be done? Exceptionally takes a function, in fact, and this function takes a throwable, the exception, and returns a T, will be transmitted to the downside completion stage. So it's something that just can just catch the exception in an asynchronous way. I've got other methods for that. Exce uh, handle, which can take uh, an executor and which has an async version. And when complete, the method I used on the, on the example, on the CDI example, which handles, which also has an async version and a version that takes an executor. So that's seven more methods in the completion, completable future uh, class leading to some kind of 40 and, and stuff. All right. Let us have a look at the a very last example. I would not finish the talk without talking about streams. It would be really sad in Java 8 not to talk about stream. And let us see how we can mix those completable future with streams. It leads to a quite complex example. I'm sorry about that. OK, we are going to create a special completable future closing just by calling the, the, the constructor like that. So this closing completable future doesn't do anything, but it's not complete. If I call the is complete or is exceptionally method on it, everything will return false. And I'm just creating a stream on a basic set of strings. Let us do that. I have a, a nice callback on the stream API, which is called the onClose callback, that can trigger some kind of operation if I call the close method of the stream uh, object. So let us begin by doing that, calling the on close. It takes uh, an action, uh, um, sorry, uh, consumer. No, it's not a consumer. It's a, uh, well, yes, it's a uh, consumer, okay, some kind of renewable um, as a parameter. And if I call the close method on the stream, it will complete the completable future that I called closing. All right, so closing the stream will complete this completable future. And in fact, I'm going to use this completable future as a trigger. It will not do anything more than trigger the operation. Then I can just do my mapping. I take all the strings and I wrap them one by one in completable future. I can even do some kind of filtering. Take the completable future with the string in it, get the result, get the length, and filter out all the length that are greater than 20. I could do further mapping if I wish. And I can do some kind of reduction. Now remember that reduction takes two parameters. First parameter is the identity element of the reduction operation. And second element is the function that will do the reduction itself. It's a binary operator here. 
So this reduction would just take two completable future with the two strings in them. We'll call the then combine, which is the right method that works in the same thread to call this uh, completable, uh, this, um, sorry, to combine those two completable future. And this binary operator will, for instance, concatenate those two strings and return the result in another completable future. Okay, great. But this closing object, which is the first completable future that has created at the first line of, of this example, is a special completable future that will be used as the seed of this operation. So in fact, the combination of all those will, be, will have this closing object as the first one. And I will combine this closing completable future, which is not complete, with other completable future, which are then them completed. So basically, it will create a whole chain of completable future that doesn't do anything, it's just a declaration since the first element is not complete yet. Right. This returns a completable future that I could call, for instance, reduce. And this is very fast to do because it doesn't do any computation. It just creates a graph of completion stage all the way along. And what happens if I want to trigger the computation? Well, as I just told you, what I need to do is to close the stream I have, the, I have uh, here. Calling close will execute closing.complete, all right, with the value passed as a parameter, and will trigger all the chain generated by my binary operator here, which will concatenate all the operations. So in fact, all the operations of this stream will be run asynchronous, asynchronously using this trick, closing the stream, and then calling the callback on the closing of the stream, which is great. And it works because, of course, this closing object is the first object of my chain. It will just cascade all the way along. Now, what happens if I want to run this in parallel? Of course, it will work because every, everything has been done uh, to do that. But what I could want to do is to run this in parallel in a special pool of thread, in a special executor. How can I do that? Well, I just need to wrap all this code into a runnable, just like this. It's a runnable that, once again, just do some computation asynchronously. Create a fork join pool. A fork join pool is an extension of the executor. Create this completable future by calling run async with this nice stream computation. Pass the fork join pool as a parameter. Since the fork join pool is also an executor, it will work. And get the result computed in that precise fork join pool, all in an asynchronous way, which is really great. All right. So the nice thing is that we now have an API for a synchronous computation in the JDK. It's quite a complex API. I think that most of the complexity does not come from the concept themselves, which are quite simple, but more from the complexity of the completable future class itself. There are many, many methods in it. Some of them are static, some of them are non-static, and it's quite hard to, to, end, to go into this, this class and to understand how it has been made. There, are, there, there is a very rich semantic with many uh, ways uh, of implementing the tasks, many methods which makes the, the understanding of this uh, quite complex. It's all built uh, on Lambda expression, which is very nice and can lead to very readable pattern. Remember the pattern on the reading of the page with the links. Forget about the pattern with the stream, it was much more, more complex. We have a very fine control of threads. Uh, I can really decide for each task to be run in that special thread. Is it an IO thread? Is it a computation thread, etc.? cetera? If it, if it reminds you something from Rx Java, it might probably be a good idea, good way. It handles chaining with a lot of semantics, one-to-one, -to -one, to one It also handles computation, and with a very clean way of handling exception, which is very nice because we didn't have really had that in a previous uh, API. And this is the conclusion of this talk. I thank you for your attention. And I was fast enough, so we have a little more than six minutes for questions. I don't know if some of you posted questions on Twitter. Let me check that. Since I can't see, I can't see absolutely anything in the room, you can try to raise your hand and make some noise <laughs> if you want to handle questions. All right. Uh, 
Oh, yes, people are telling me that they love me. Thank you for that. I, I, can, I can send you the number of my bank account if you really want to. <laughs> ah, there's a question in the room. Sorry. I can't see it, so just shout. Oh, right, yeah. Can you go back to the stream example? Can I go back to the stream? Oh, sure. You really want to see that again? <laughs> I, I will publish the slide. If you check the, the hashtag I just gave, I will publish the slide on SlideShare. So, so if it's just to take a picture, forget about it. Uh, shouldn't get be joined. Shouldn't get be joined in a filter call. No, because the completed future, because here I'm building a completed future. So this future is already completed. So the get method will return immediately. Sorry? Ah, the checks exception. There's a checks exception here? I'm not sure. Is it? All right, so join. OK, cool, join. Um, you mean the filter call? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you if you run this code, basically it's about uh, if you if in the binary operator, if you uh, if you add uh, string concatenation and run this code you, several times, you will see that the string contact, contact, concatenation doesn't take place always in the same order, which really shows that it, it is run in parallel. Yes. It, it, of course, if your for example has more than one thread, because if it has only one thread, it's parallelism, but in one thread, so it's not parallelism anymore, really. Yeah? Any other questions? All right. Uh, can uh, exceptionally provide different completable future dep depending on the type of the exception? Yes, absolutely. You can you can have a function that takes throwable and then check uh, the type of exception you have in it and then decide to return. Of course, these types has to have to be compatible because the the function uh, has a, has a certain type itself, so it, it cannot return something that does not extend the declared uh, the declared type. Do we have other questions? Ah, don't you think that when doing async computation, signaling errors using exceptions is an anti-pattern? So it's an error itself, you mean? But to, to signal this error, would you would you use exceptions or throwable? Uh, well, exception is the is the the standard way of of dealing with errors in Java. So we have to live with it. I think uh, the nice thing is that we do not have to live. Uh, th this API has not been built on checked exception, but unchecked exception. So at least it doesn't appear in the in the in the signatures of the of the method and of the calls. But get exception. Sometimes you, you if you're doing some kind of I/O, you will have to deal with exception that you don't have the end on. So so you you need, you need to be able to do that anyway. Completable future seems to have some similarities to promises and differs in JavaScript. This is not really a question. This is this is a comment. All right, you get it. If you use either method to the remaining completable future, will they get cancelled? Um, you need to check the exact API for that. I don't, I don't have the right answer for that. I think yes, but I'm not quite sure. But if you, if you call cancel on the completable future that is already uh, done, then, then it, will, it, will not do, uh, it will not do anything. Do we have more questions? Yes, we have. Cancel does not stop the thread it is running on. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. This, this is how executors work, in fact. This is the difference between calling new thread and passing a runnable. Yeah? Uh, what about the feasibility of uh, changes in one thread and another? Is it handled by the framework? Sorry, I didn't hear you. The uh, feasibility of changes in one thread. Yeah. Is yeah. Yeah. This is the nice thing. You don't have to handle synchronization yourself. This is the nice thing. 
All right, we have one minute left for questions, so I think it's a bit too late now. Uh, I'll be around in a in 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 place, so if you want to grab my hand, I'd be more than happy to, to have a chat with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>